Hi, Misha here. And I was trying to think of something a little different to talk about. And yeah, while Millsurp has a very dedicated but sometimes small market, I really do like talking about it. One thing that is popular for us Americans, the shotgun. So I thought I'd see how a video on a Millsurp shotgun would do. And when I kind of poked around the interwebs, I was a little surprised that there are not many vid videos out there on the Winchester Model 1912 or M12 trench gun. There's a few videos on the civilian or even riot version, and there's a number of videos on the Winchester 1897 namely CN Arsenal's I would say is one of the best but yeah not much on the model 1912 and this is mine here you've seen it in a few videos so let's talk about it because there's a lot of myths and rumors and frankly a good bit of misinformation out there about both Winchester trench shotguns trench guns as well as the others and we'll even talk about why he uses a British bayonet instead of a good old American one. <laughs> but uh, sorry, this isn't one I'm going to be shooting. Hate to disappoint, but there you go. The U.S. military, namely the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines, although the, well, modern-day Air Forces and uh, Navy have also used shotguns, but it is a kind of a unique weapon for the United States. That's not to say other nations have not employed shotguns. They surely have. But the U.S. really thought they were on to something. And it was after experiences in the Philippines. Now, this gun here is derived from a John Moses Browning system. Actually, it was Spencer that started off with the first kind of slide-action shotguns way back at the end of the 19th century. These were using the older uh, two-and-a-half-inch rounds. Browning would come along and, marketing through Winchester, would make the 1893. And then it would be strengthened and updated into the 1897. Nominally, so it could fire the, the newer two and three quarters rounds that were starting to come into use about this time. And that gun would be purchased in very small numbers by U.S. forces in the Philippines after they ended up with control following the Spanish-American War. Very small numbers, a couple of hundred, plus some other shotguns in use. It was very much an a non-standard type gun, very special purpose, but it did the job, and it kind of, kind of put the the gun in the back of a lot of military officers' minds, including a younger <laughs> Black Jack Pershing, who of course would end up being General John Pershing of World War One fame, and when, of course, the American Expeditionary Force, when America was involved in the war beginning in April 1917, the idea of a riot shotgun came about. And it was actually the U.S. Army Ordnance Department that was charged with picking which to, which to purchase for World War I. And while the 1912 had just come out, it was actually... An improvement on the Browning design by Mr. Johnson. Essentially, he enclosed it, whereas the 1897 pattern, it was open with an exposed hammer. A few other updates, too, of course. It was available. It was first released, not surprisingly, in 1912, but maybe a little interestingly, originally it was chambered for 20 gauge. The 12 gauge model would not be released until 1914. So it was actually quite new in 1917, and I think that has a lot to do with why they didn't pick it. Instead, they went with the model 
1897. They would also purchase the Remington Model 10 in smaller numbers. And the idea, this was to be one of the implements used to break the stalemate of the trenches. You know, d dive in there, the tight quarters, twists and turns. Six rounds, five plus one of 12 gauge, typically double lot buck. Sounded good, but what happens when you're out of ammo? 12 gauge ammo was pretty heavy and bulky, so it was quickly decided that it would need a bayonet. And when it was hot, a handguard. So this assembly was designed at the Springfield Arsenal by Henry Brewer, at least predominantly. It's a whole assembly. It actually clamps on to the barrel. Has three screws that are slotted into little grooves. So it will very much clamp on very securely. Now this is of course a World War II production, so it's the four hole variety. World War I era, it would be six holes, smaller, but obviously this is a little easier to machine, a little more durable. It is sheet steel up here, machine steel down here. So that was designed at Springfield. And the Winchester, 1897, was picked. But they had to figure out a bayonet to use. So why this one? Well, the answer is quite obvious, frankly. I bet you already know it. Even though the USA was not directly involved in the Great War until the spring of 1917, it was definitely financially involved since the beginning. And it was producing this rifle here, the Winchester factory and the Remington factory, the P-14 and 303 for them. And of course, since this was a British design meant for the British, it took a British pattern bayonet. The contract was actually over by 1917, but the tooling and the know-how was there, and the U.S. was far too short on model 1903 Springfield rifles and 30-06, so it was quite a simple thing to rework the P-14 to fire 30-06. They even got one extra round out of it because of the rimless round, and that's how we ended up with the model 1917. And it still took the infield type bayonet. And because seeing is believing, here it is on the 1917. Very long assembly. And Winchester made a large number of these, although mine here is from Eddie Stone, a sub factory of Remington. So they had these bayonets, so they had a choice. They could either make a modification to let the shotgun take the 1905 bayonet or the P-13 style bayonet. Now, since the assembly was being jointly developed between Springfield and Winchester, either one really probably could have been gone with, but for whatever reason, they went with the infield pattern probably because more bayonets were on hand and of course because Winchester was producing both the rifle and the shotgun so it probably just made more sense. Either way that's what they went with. Now we're talking of course still about the the M97 trench shotgun. They actually had no M12 trench shotguns later shortened to just trench guns by media and propaganda in World War I. But for the 97, they would have the long barrel version, either 28 or 30 inch for training and sometimes guard duty. They would have the short barreled riot model for mostly guard duty. And they would have the 20 inch version with the assembly heat shield, bayonet lug, front sling swivel, and then a rear swivel on the stock. This would be for guard duty again, and for use by patrols, scouting units, and of course use in no man's land. And an initial order of roughly 10,000 was placed. By January of 1918, Winchester had a contract for them, 
and numbers get a little foggy. It seems like by June they had five to ten thousand available, and again, most would be allocated for guard and other things as well as use at home, but several thousand were deployed in the field to see how they would work out. And in the beginning, they were quite well received. A lot had to do with the fact that this is as heavy and as bulky as a rifle, so you really couldn't have both a, say, 1917 rifle and a shotgun. So a person had to have a dedicated role. This is why they were of limited utility. What they found was they were good for patrols, they were good for night fighting, they were, of course, good for close quarters trench fighting, perhaps, you know, urban fighting, although there was very, there's basically none of that in the Great War. What they really discovered was the paper shells of the day were very ill-suited for combat, so it ended up they ordered brass shells, much heavier and more expensive, but also a lot better suited for combat. They also needed to actually order web gear to work with them, and all this took time. Essentially, the brass shells and the pouches for the 12 gauge themselves while they were readied in 1918, they pretty much were expecting to use them in the offense of 1919 that never came to pass because the, the you know, armistice in November of 1918. So really my point is the trench gun didn't see a lot of use in the First World War, even though it's very identified with it. How many were there? Well, it's hard to say because it was a mix of trench and riot guns, so with or without the bayonet bracket, it seems like roughly 20 to 25,000 trench guns were in World War I or at least available right after. They had expected to ship as many as 35,000, again, that big offense plan for 1919, but this order was probably curtailed far before that, which actually explains why some ended up on the police market in the 1920s. But that number of twenty to 25,000 also counts a few Remington Model 10s and some kind of odds and ends and other accounting. So it's really hard to say. The only Model 12s in World War I were fewer than a thousand non-bayonet equipped versions used for guard and training purposes back home. So very few M12s were used. During the interwar period, the U.S. really did not need any more shotguns, certainly not trench guns. Some riot versions and long barrel versions may have been purchased. It doesn't really matter. Moving forward, 1941, they report about 21,000 in inventory, presumably mostly trench guns, or some could be mixed as riots. The numbers get weird because we have so two different patterns of Winchester and two different variants of those. So sometimes the numbers get conflated and mixed around. What is for sure, by March of 1942, Winchester receives an order for more. They do order more M97s. And they order, for the first time, M12s with the Springfield-based adapter system here and some were delivered in 1942 and deliveries would continue through 43 and the last order was placed in March of 1944 presumably delivered either later, later that year or by early 1945 and the World War II era guns are a little different with the model 12 here the earliest ones can have a high blue finish, but very quickly it would that would give way to a matte blue finish, kind of a military finish, with more than a few tool marks often apparent. And then by 1944, towards the end of the production run, they would start phosphating, parkerizing these from the factory. So how many were ultimately obtained? And what are some signs it's an original one and not a fake? Well, for the M97 trench gun, it seems like they purchased between 25,000 and about 39,000 during World War II. I've read two conflicting numbers. 
take it as you will. And the 97s from this point are the military gray blue for the most part. And they actually were, they were of the takedown pattern, kind of interesting. But the Model 12s were not. They were the non-takedown style from this period. And they would acquire more M12s, about 61,000 total. And while the bulk were of the trench gun variety, there was a not insignificant number of riot guns, so 20 inch barrel, and even some long barreled models, again, for training and what have you. So, yeah. With production ending by 1945. So, um, what's some good ways to kind of ID these? And that is very important because this is a very faked gun. Very faked. So if a gun starts off with a long barrel, some might try to cut it down. There's two giveaways there. For one, it should be a cylinder bore gun. Essentially, a, you know, no, no real choke to the pattern. For another, the, the cut is not correct here. If it's you know, a cut down 28, 30 inch barrel. Typically the crowns look weird, frankly. If it's a riot gun that came out of the factory with a 20 inch barrel, one easy way I think to tell them is if you notice on the trench gun, the bead sight is actually attached to the uh, handguard, the heat shield assembly. On a non-heat shield gun, of course, it would be attached directly to the barrel. And if you were to feel inside the bore, there would be a hole. There would be evidence where a bead sight was once installed directly on the barrel. So that's one thing I often check is the muzzle and here, as well as the markings on the barrel. Like I said, the shroud should have four holes. I think there's 19 front to back. And it will have a little W mark on it from Winchester. Of course, originally trench guns would have the leather sling. And then, of course, in the war and after, they would get the newer style. Furniture is walnut, including on the buttstock. And the butt plate's kind of interesting. You might expect these to have a steel butt plate, but they don't, or they should not. It should actually be a Winchester marked black. It's often called a hard rubber butt plate. Either way, synthetic butt plate with the Winchester logo. Seems counterintuitive, I know, but it's what they did. And again, there should be a sling swivel on the underside of the stock here. There should also be ordnance markings on top of the receiver, the frame, and the barrel and serial numbers. Uh, the best I can tell, serials start off just shy of 939,000. There are some reported in the 938 range. And they go up to about 1,036,000. Now, just because a gun is in that range, which is nearly 100,000 guns, if you notice, doesn't mean it was originally a trench gun. It doesn't even mean it was originally a military gun. That's just the range. Because civilian guns and police guns and maybe a few foreign contract guns were still made in this receiver range. By the way, of course, markings on the side, M12, U.S., Yada yada. The left side's maybe a little less interesting. Nearly slab side, certainly no big logos on it. Of course, on the barrel we have the Winchester markings. But the big one to look for on this side is on the buttstock. We should have a cartouche, the cross cannons, and most of these have GHD guy. Drury's 
Mark. He was the inspector for the Springfield District, so the eastern kind of seaboard district. Some, especially riot versions, have W, uh, WD or WB, I can't remember, stamped on them. So there are at least two markings on the military guns. And pretty much all the trench guns should have the GHD on them because he was inspector there throughout their entire run. So we should see markings on the buttstock, on the receiver frame, on the barrel, on the shroud assembly, and of course we know roughly the serial range it should be in. As far as the mechanics of the gun, it's standard. You have 5 plus 1 in the tube, plus 1 in the chamber, manual safety here, concealed hammer, 2 and 3 quarter only, not 3 inch magnum, <laughs> and yes you can slam fire these. You should not. In fact, I have seen firsthand someone have an accident trying to slam fire a Winchester. In that case, it was in 1897, but the same thing could happen with a 12. Yeah, be mindful of that. It seems cool on paper, but it, yeah, <laughs> you, you, it may go off sooner than you think. These are very good, robust guns made from high-grade machine steel. Again, the wartime production can have some pretty visible tool marks and machine marks on them because they were just trying to get these out. But the internals, all this, the system, it's very smooth. So maybe that'll help you a little bit. Try to ID one, see if it's authentic or not. And what about their service? Because they certainly had service. Even though I won't shoot it for you, I will mount the bayonet. I actually don't remember which one of my bayonets I picked. Just one of them out of the bucket. <laughs> well, the trench guns produced in World War II saw very little use in the, in the European or even the North African theaters. There just wasn't a need. The, the Blitzkrieg style, the non-trench fighting, it just wasn't called for, and by the time there might have been house-to-house -house fighting towards the end of the war, they had submachine guns and one grands and one carbines. So its time in Europe would have to have been for its father, the 97 design. But in the Pacific, it's a different story. While the U.S. Army did order a number, they mostly gave those to MPs, guards, used them for training, and the Navy ordered some too, again, using them on board ships for training, maybe dock, guard duty. The uh, Army Air Corps evolving into the Army Air Forces before becoming independent in, in 1947, used them for guard duty, especially air bases, aerodromes, as the Brits would call them. It was the U.S. Marines that really ran with this in the Pacific. Part of it was... The Marines were behind. They were amongst the last to get the newer guns, like the M1 Grand. This is why they had to make do with the Rising submachine gun. <laughs> so you can understand why a gun like this, quite short and powerful at close range, would be advantageous for some of the fighting in the Pacific. Uh, if you're talking about going into caves or underground tunnels, or even in thick foliage and jungles in, you know, the different tropical areas, it makes a lot of sense. Typically, the guy on point would have one of these. By this point, there were still some paper cartridges floating about, but the Marines quickly realized, again, paper cartridges are no good. They used some brass and some plastic cartridges started to come in during World War II as well, which is kind of the best of both worlds. You get the lighter weight and the cheaper production of paper, well, nearly so, but you get the better durability and resistance to moisture of, of brass. So yeah, really the trench guns, be it the 97 or the M12, saw their use in the Pacific, and they were quite well-liked and respected, especially 1942-1943.
because there were still plenty left over from World War I and plenty more coming throughout World War II. That's why after the war, the U.S. had more than enough, still a very specialist weapon, keep in mind, that they just did not need any more, even when Korea rolled around. Good God does this thing long with a bayonet attached, which is kind of the point. <laughs> so even though no new 97s or 12s were purchased following the Second World War, many were on hand when the Korean War kicked off, and yet again, the Marines would use them, as well as some in the Army. And they were well suited for like mountain fighting in Korea, as well as any other kind of close quarters type fighting that might come about, but probably not quite as well suited as the Pacific. And some would be lost or worn out during the war. But they were still available in 1960s for the Vietnam War. And again, they were used in the tropical fighting, the jungle fighting, especially going into some tunnels that they weren't too claustrophobic. Sometimes the tun tunnels were so tight in Vietnam that even a shotgun with a 20-inch barrel was too big, so 1911 pistol it was. But when it was possible, they would use these there. They would also give several away as aid to South Vietnamese troops. But by this point, they're starting to run out of guns. Some are just worn out, some are lost or damaged beyond repair, and like I said, some were given away, so they need new. Now Winchester stopped making the 97 around 1956, and they mostly discontinued the Model 12 by 1963, although they kept doing little runs of them, kind of using up their existing parts through about 1966. Either way, they weren't available, and they really weren't economical anymore. This was old world technology. So as they wore out, they would be replaced by Winchester's Model 1200, totally different system, frankly, as well as this newfangled thing called the Remington 870, and eventually this really newfangled thing called the Mossberg 500. But it would take a long time. Winchester Model 12s would hang out in inventory throughout Vietnam and even into the 1980s, but in increasingly small numbers. Although I did talk to a couple of guys in 91 that had like two of them still in their inventory, <laughs> along with some older 1200s. That's because the basic pump shotgun hasn't really changed much since this. Probably the biggest update would be the ability to fire three inch magnum loads, but the concealed design with the elevator here, the cross bolt safety here. Yeah, that's pretty much how shotguns look even to this day. Like I said at the beginning, I was quite surprised there isn't much in the way of information on the YouTubes here about the M12 trench gun, so thought I would talk about mine. I always wanted to own one, but I never thought I would. Uh, fakes are too prevalent, and even now it's just, because it's so visually oriented, it's nothing I can really delve into with 100% satisfaction, and they're so expensive that it's something that I wasn't willing to risk. As I mentioned in past videos, I received this one from a friend a couple of years ago, and he had picked it up decades ago. Now that's no guarantee. Fakes have been made since the 60s, so you can't just say, well, yeah. But it does help to have a trustworthy source, if it, you know, as it were. Um, and it works for me. If it's a fake, it's a good one. The markings are correct, the finish is correct, and the serial's in the right range. At that point, you just, you, you do your best and you kind of just have to go with it. But I thought this was a good time to do a deep dive into probably one of the best old school service guns, service shotguns available. The 97 is very iconic and I, I really like it, but this concealed hammer design of the 12 is so much more modern and frankly effective. And it's just a little more ergonomic, like in the grip area of the stock. 
And I do actually like the look of the four hole World War II handguard a little bit better. Seems a little uh, stouter, if that makes sense. And of course, different bayonets were used. A lot of the time you'll see the Vietnam ones with the modern grips, all that good stuff. But anyway, yeah, I was, th I was just trying to think of something to show that I haven't talked about ad nauseum, and I realized that like everyone else, I too had kind of overlooked this, at least as far as a major video. So hope this was of, uh, of interest to you. Of course, I've covered more modern military guns. I've done many videos on the Benelli M4, the M1014, and the Mossberg M590A1. So if you like the more modern shotguns, plenty of videos on this channel about those as well. With that, I appreciate you tuning in. If you could, please like, share, subscribe, and as always, if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to the Patreon page. This is Misha. Hope you are doing very well, and I will catch you very soon next time.